Hi, everyone. Welcome to the fourth in our series of Restore Virtual Discussions. Uh, I'm very excited today to introduce you to Professor Roger Barker. Uh, if you don't know him already, he's at the leading edge of stem cell therapy as it pertains to the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And I thought that this would be a great opportunity for us to learn more about what has uh, transpired and what's worked and what the challenges have been in a field that uh, admittedly is further along than retinal ganglion cell replacement is. Uh, Parkinson's disease cell transplantation has been under preclinical investigation for many years now. And as uh, Dr. Barker will tell us, is now at the stage of human clinical trial. Uh, so uh, they've made that translation from bench to bedside. And while uh, there's still a lot of work to be done, I think uh, this is a real testament to uh, the, the work and success that can come from large-scale collaborative endeavors aiming to treat neurodegenerative disease with cell therapy. Uh, so like uh, all of our virtual discussions, the plan is for Dr. Barker to start off with uh, maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes of some background information telling us about the journey that his field has taken to get to this stage. And then after that, we'll leave about 45 minutes for group discussion where we can do questions and answers and try to take the most salient points from the conversation and uh, think about how we can use those uh, experiences and, and ideas to foster collaborative efforts to move our own field of retinal ganglion cell replacement forward. Uh, so with that, I will stop the screen share and ask Dr. Barker to take it away. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think that is, is that up in proper, is that? Yep, it's, there we go, full screen, that looks perfect. Okay, so thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I have just changed the title very slightly. Sure. So I removed the word uh, success because <laughs> it's successfully translated but whether it's successfully worked is yet to be decided so i thought i would just have it learn from this translational uh story so i thought uh what i would do is i would introduce you a little bit to what parkinson's disease is the rationale for it and i'm going to take you through the sort of history of this field which is about uh 40 odd years old so it's a much older field than people perhaps uh, realize so the first question, I suppose, where we need to start is, you know, what is Parkinson's disease? And I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this. So um, for our discussion today, it is a clinical diagnosis. And uh, as I go through, I try and highlight various points. So that creates a little bit of a problem in our, in our trials because we have to make the assumption that people have Parkinson's disease based on their clinical characteristics. We have no diagnostic test. Um, but essentially, people who look as though they've got Parkinson's disease with this resting, cold, rolling tremor, some stiffness, slowness, bit of problems with walking uh, and a response to medication, about 95 to 99 percent of those will have Parkinson's disease. But we can't be certain. And that does create some problems when you're designing trials, because there is the potential that some of your patients don't actually have the condition which you think they have. So clinically, Parkinson's disease looks like this. Pathologically, it's defined by the loss of a very discrete population of neurons which project from the upper brain stem in the substantia nigra up into the putamen. And in the human, there are about 400,000 on either side of the brain. And when you've lost 200,000 of those, you develop the first clinical features of motor Parkinson's disease. Ergo, if you can replace 200,000 dopamine cells of the right type, you should, in essence, put people back to normal. So that's the uh, clinical uh, definition. That's the pathological uh, substrate for that. And we know that that pathway, that loss of that dopaminergic nigrostriatal pathway, is critical to the expression for the disease because for uh, 50 years and more, we have used that as the basis for our treatment. So the current treatment of Parkinson's disease in the clinic is you use either enzyme inhibitors to increase the amount of dopamine in your brain, you replace the dopamine with L-dopa, you stimulate the dopamine receptors with dopamine agonists or apomorphine infusions, and then you basically treat the complications of that therapy with amantadine to get rid of some of the involuntary movements that the drugs drive and deep brain stimulation to try and correct the networks which are giving you abnormal movements. So essentially the entire treatment of Parkinson's disease in 2023 
is around restoring that nigrospinal pathway uh, and dealing with the complications that result from it. And so when we come on to talk about how we're going to repair the brain in Parkinson's disease, what am I actually hoping to achieve? Uh, it's important, first of all, to realise that the pathology of Parkinson's disease is much more extensive than just the nigrostriatal pathway. And this is a quite a famous picture. All the red is the ascending pathology you see in Parkinson's disease. And so uh, the earliest features begin in the lower brainstem and then project up and out into the cortex. So actually nigral loss is stage three. But nevertheless, as I say, that is known to be the critical pathology and that is what we're trying to repair. So we're quite realistic about what we're trying to do. We're trying to put that pathway uh, back to normal. And when it comes to your own work, I think it's important to understand which bit of the network am I actually trying to repair? Does the disease only localise to that area, in which case, uh, you know, is my therapy only dealing with one aspect of it? And I think it's important because you then have to answer the question, well, what does this actually mean for patients with Parkinson's disease? If we got this to work and we could actually get this to achieve uh, uh, the success that I'm going to come on to talk about, then what would it treat in Parkinson's disease? Well, obviously what it would treat is it would treat all the things that we can currently treat in the clinic with dopamine drugs. So it would be as good as the best response to the medication we have at the moment, which then sets up some competitive questions about what is the point of pursuing this if you actually are only trying to achieve what you can do in the clinic uh, at the present time. But the important point, and there are a number of important points about this whole strategy, the first is if it worked and it worked consistently and it worked very well, then the treatment of Parkinson's disease would be radically simplified into a single one-off treatment to repair the dopaminergic nigrostriatal pathway, that would therefore uh, uh, get rid of all the need to use any of the drugs that we do at the moment, plus all the complications. So in essence, it would transform the uh, treatment of Parkinson's disease uh, going forward. It would also, because we know from studies where people have given patients uh, dopamine uh, in the on-off state, so the, this experiment is you take someone with Parkinson's disease, you look at the connectivity in the brain before and after they take dopamine. And what you find is that the dopamine isn't just replaced at the site where you uh, need it, but it also normalizes network flow through the structure where dopamine is put back, namely through the striatum. So it will normalize uh, that circuit. So when you just replace what's missing, it will actually normalize the output from that circuit, which obviously uh, mediates its clinical benefit. So why would I want to do that instead of just using the drugs I use at the moment? Well, obviously, uh, it's a one-off treatment, which has various advantages. It also has primary advantages over the treatments we use at the moment. First of all, the therapy would only target the area which is lost, uh, dopamine is lost. That could be a limitation of it, but it's also an advantage because obviously all the oral medications stimulate dopaminergic networks, which are largely intact, and that drives some of the uh, cognitive problems that you see in Parkinson's, it drives some of the neuropsychiatric problems that you see in Parkinson's, and it exacerbates some of the other problems, such as the autonomic uh, problems around postural hypotension. So it would avoid all the off-target effects, and it would also avoid all the long-term complications you see with the oral medication, especially L-DOPA, where you get these genesis of these involuntary movements uh, after people have been on this medication for a number of years, these so-called on-off phenomena and dyskinesias. This treatment would avoid that. So it would transform what we could do in the treatment of the patient, um, but it's also important to understand what it won't do. And I think this is important because in this field, as you know as well as I do, there are many extravagant claims made about these type of therapies. Quite obviously, I'm only repairing the nigrostriatal dopaminergic network. So anything that lies outside of that, any other network, any other dopaminergic system, as well as all the other pathologies you see in Parkinson's, which underlies a lot of these other features of Parkinson's, will not be helped by this treatment. So I will not be treating the autonomic problems. I will not be treating the cholinergic deficits underlying some of the gait disorders and cognitive problems. I may be uh, ameliorating some of the problems you see with that by reducing the medication that they normally take orally, but I will not be treating those aspects of it. And I will certainly not be curing this condition. Now, it may be different in your area, but it, you know the primary problem in Parkinson's is the accumulation of a pathogenic protein within cells, alpha-synuclein. Uh, I am not targeting alpha-synuclein. I am not uh, dealing with the fundamental pathological pathway. So I will never cure anyone with this therapy. 
Having said that, it is a disease modifying therapy in the sense that before L-DOPA was used in the 1960s, your life expectancy with Parkinson's disease was probably about 10 years before the motor symptoms and motor signs would overwhelm the patient, and they would die, typically of aspiration, uh, typically of pneumonias. Uh, whereas uh, once symptomatic therapy came along, they obviously live actually normal lives, most people with Parkinson's disease in terms of life expectancy. And the same is true of asthma. You very rarely cure people of asthma, but you can control them very well symptomatically. So good symptomatic therapy, whilst not being disease modifying and curing, nevertheless can have a dramatic effect on the natural history of this condition. And obviously, because this is an intervention where I'm putting something into the brain into a specific site, there's no reason it couldn't be used with other disease modifying therapies, uh, such as cocktails of drugs designed to get uh, at the basis of the sort of pathological aspects of Parkinson's. So it's not mutually exclusive. It isn't you either have this or you have a disease modifying therapy in the traditional sense. You could actually have the two together. And finally, it's important to realise it won't be suitable for all patients. The average age to get Parkinson's is 70, so there'll be a lot of people in their 80s who respond quite nicely to medication, have a life expectancy of only a relatively short period of time for which this type of intervention would not be suitable. If you have patients who don't respond to dopamine drugs for whatever reason, they won't uh, benefit from this therapy. So I think it's also important to be realistic that it's not suitable uh, for everybody, but one would hope that it's suitable for enough people to make it economically viable for the investment that's needed to take this into the clinic. So then how could you repair this pathway? How could I put the nigrostriatal pathway back to normal? Well, obviously, one way is to repair it from within. You could enhance the uh, neurogenic process underlying the production of new midbrain dopamine cells, which would be great, except that doesn't happen in the adult human brain, as far as we know. You can make dopamine neurons in situ, and I'll come back to the end, the idea of in situ reprogramming. And there's obviously been a great deal of interest in the use of growth factors to try and stimulate the survival and growth of those remaining dopamine cells in people with Parkinson's disease, which has had a very uh, checkered history, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but happy to discuss it uh, uh, later. Uh, the more obvious way, and, then what, and what I'm going to concentrate on today, is uh, repair from without. In other words, just replace what's missing. So the strategy here is obviously quite straightforward. I'm just going to replace the lost dopaminergic neurons, which lie at the heart of Parkinson's disease, and which I target with my oral therapies, with a new set of fresh uh, midbrain uh, nigral dopamine cells. And they have to be of the midbrain type and ideally of the A9 nigral of the type specifically lost in Parkinson's disease because there's a lot of experimental work showing that actually if you use cells which do not uh, have those characteristics, they do not work as well as those uh, which are lost in Parkinson's disease, i.e. the nigral A9, one, A9 neurons. So that is what we're going to concentrate on. So we want to repair the brain by transplanting in uh, a population of dopamine cells, of which 200,000 will survive and differentiate into the midbrain dopamine cells of the type lost in Parkinson's disease. So then the question is, well, what could I use for that? What could I actually use to replace those cells? So one place, and which this is where... Uh, the field was, uh, particularly in the 1980s, was to go hunting around the body and find a dopamine-rich source in the patient themselves and then do autologous grafting. And the two areas where people got particularly interested were the adrenal medulla, obviously uh, uh, the adrenal gland next to the kidney, the medulla, which produces obviously a lot of adrenaline and noradrenaline, not very much in the way dopamine was chosen, and the carotid body, which obviously sits next to the carotid artery, senses oxygen, contains dopamine cells. And these have been the subject of uh, rather limited preclinical work with limited efficacy and survival, but nevertheless translated into the clinic and essentially uh, were shown not to work. And I'll just briefly mention that in a minute. An alternative is to use the developing dopamine cells from the human fetus. So this would involve the collection of uh, uh, fetuses from termination of pregnancies, from abortions, uh, dissecting out the developing dopamine cells from the midbrain of that fetus and then transplanting those into the adult Parkinsonian brain. And then obviously, uh, more recently, uh, since 1998, and the first uh, human ES cells were derived, you could use a human embryonic stem cell from an IVF program, or you could, since 2007, use a reprogrammed uh, somatic cell into an IPS cell, which can then be driven into a dopamine cell of the type 
uh, that one wants. So obviously there are many different sources one can use. And as I've said, essentially these adult sources, which were autologously transplanted, were very much the fashion in the 80s and the early part of the 1990s and were shown not to work. Preclinically, the evidence was quite clear that these had a very modest effect, if any. The survival was very poor. And when it came to patients, that was uh, uh, recapitulated. There were uh, very few surviving cells in those that came to post-mortem. The clinical benefits were minimal and very transient. And the morbidity associated with the intervention was quite substantial. So essentially, this idea has uh, essentially disappeared, although the use of adult cells and uh, making iPS cells from that uh, from that from patients as well as from uh, unaffected individuals has gained prominence of, of late and I'll come back to that. But the area that received the most attention and which underpins the entire field uh, starts uh, with the use of fetal dopamine cells. So as I say, this is not an ethically neutral area, especially in the United States where this will require human fetal material. Um, but this work, which obviously began preclinically, in uh, rats and essentially uh, originated in Lund in Sweden uh, with Anders Bjorklund and his team and was then translated into the clinic by Ulla Lindvall, his clinical colleague. And essentially what this uh, demonstrated, and this was preclinical work which took place over about an eight year period but was replicated in many other labs, was they essentially used a very simple model. So they lesioned the nigral striatal pathway, uh, projecting up through the medial forebrain bundle and they did this with a toxin, classically 6-hydroxydopamine. Now, people say, well, this is not Parkinson's disease, so this is a useless model. And I would entirely agree this is not Parkinson's disease, and it's a useless model of Parkinson's disease. But what I'm interested in is not treating Parkinson's disease. I'm interested in treating the dopamine loss of the nigrostriatal pathway. So as long as I have a model that, uh, um, that captures that loss of that pathway, it's perfectly good for the system that I wish to test, which in this case is restoration of dopamine into the denervated striatum, which is where the cells are placed. And it's important to realize that, that essentially all of the success that's happened in this field has not derived from transplanting the cells into the substantia nigra and having them grow up into the striatum, but is placing the cells where their uh, dopamine is needed, which is in the striatum or the chordate in the patamen. And so over an eight year period, there were essentially uh, this lesion, which was developed in the 1970s. Subsequently, uh, you know, other models have been developed, transgenic models, the use of alpha synuclein preformed fibrils to replicate more that takes place in Parkinson's disease. But fundamentally, if you knock out the dopamine system, that's what you're after. You then want to monitor the deficits, which in animals is very easily done with drug induced rotation. You can do cognitive testing, you transplant your cells in, you monitor the deficits to see if they recover. And then at the end, you sacrifice and do your histology. So that's very standard for all of these types of work. And what was shown over this period of time, and this is a transplant from my PhD in the dark ages, uh, was that actually uh, this is the stride. So in the, mat, in the rat, you don't have called and patame and split it by the internal capsules you do in humans. It's just one structure. But this brown sausage here, is fetal uh, dopamine cells from a rat fetus, so embryonic day 14, transplanted into the adult rat. Uh, all of the brown you see around these are the fibres that are grown out, and on the outside of this transplant are all of the surviving dopamine cells. And so what was shown, as I say, over about a 10-year period and consistently between labs, was that if you used allografted tissue, i.e. rat to rat, it survived long term, which in a rodent was six months to a year. That if you dissected out the developing midbrain from these uh, fetuses, so the ventral midbrain, uh, they differentiated into the dopamine cells of the type which you'd find in the adults of uh, midbrain. It was shown through the limited tracing studies that were available in the 1980s that these transplants could make and receive connections from the host. So they didn't just sit there and pump out dopamine, they made some sort of synaptic network that they released dopamine, that they restored many of the behaviours you uh, induce in these animals with these unilateral lesions, but not all of them. Uh, but you could restore some of the critical ones, and it was reproducibly done in many labs. And so it was shown to be a consistent and robust effect. So this then led in the late 1980s to a whole series of trials which ran through uh, a series of open label studies mainly done in uh, Sweden, in Lund, but they were also done in Paris. They were done in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, 
uh, and they were done in Denver by Kurt Freed as well as other sites. So there were a number of centers that undertook this approach, which, as I say, in the case of humans, involves collecting tissue from human fetal material, typically six to eight weeks uh, post conception. You, you dissect out the developing midbrain and you transplant it in. And in order to ensure that you have enough surviving dopamine cells after that procedure, you typically need, I would say, to transplant in at least uh, material from three to four fetuses per side of the brain. Um, and what we found over this period of time in the open label studies, that the results were very inconsistent, but when it worked, it worked extremely well. So these are two patients who were followed up uh, in London, who received their transplants in Sweden. And on this picture here, what one can see is that uh, essentially they had had Pugsies for 10 years before they were grafted. So both these patients had uh, Pugsies for 10 years. And here you can see at about 20 years post-transplantation that their uh, scores have improved. So, so the UPDRS here on the uh, y-axis is the uh, higher you are, the worse you are. And you can see that these patients drop down to about 20 which is about uh, the score you probably have by the time you actually present to your uh, neurologist in the first place. And that was remained consistent over a 20-year uh, period, it took about five years for the maximum benefit to be seen. And this was in the face of them stopping all of their medication. So in these two patients, 30 years after diagnosis, they were on no medication. They had a UPDRS score that was probably less than when they first presented. And on their PET scan, looking at dopamine in their brain, it was essentially normalized. So uh, this was a proof of concept that you could get long-term clinical benefits. This was uh, patient number four in Sweden who had a unilateral transplant. He uh, derived similar benefits, uh, came off all of his medication, but eventually succumbed to a dementia with Parkinson's many years later. This is his post-mortem 24 years after receiving the transplant, 30 odd years into his Parkinson's disease. He had a non-grafted side, so he had a transplant on one side. This is stained for dopamine fibers with TH, absolutely nothing. And everything you see through these sections are surviving dopamine cells in innovation of the Parkinsonian pertainment. So there was clear evidence that in some cases, these transplants could survive long term, uh, both clinically on PET and at post-mortem. The results were somewhat inconsistent, but what slightly derailed the field were these two NIH funded studies, which began in 1992 when Clinton came into the White House and allowed federal funding for the use of human fetal material. So in this first study, which was published in the New England Journal in 20, uh, uh, 2001, there were 40 patients in this study, 20 were randomized to have a transplant uh, uh, and 20 were randomized to have sham surgery. They were followed up uh, for a year. At the end of a year, they were asked how they felt. Uh, those who had the transplant felt no different to those who had not had the transplant. The non-grafted group were actually offered a transplant. So ultimately, 33 of these patients had a transplant. So if you look over the first 12 months, which obviously is a short period of time, there was no significant benefit from having a transplant versus uh, sham surgery, although you can see the patients were much more advanced than those uh, in the Swedish study, and that there is clearly a, a downslope with the uh, transplant, but not the non-transplanted. Uh, so there was no significant benefit, but what was slightly worrying was that 15%, so three out of the five out of the 33 patients who eventually had a transplant, develop these involuntary movements, these dyskinesias in the absence of medication and the presence of a transplant, which created some concern because obviously you can't get the transplant back. So there were side effects which were now appearing, which had not been seen previously in the context of a trial that had shown no benefit from the therapy at a time when deep brain stimulation was becoming uh, much more favored as a treatment for people with advancing Parkinson's disease. The second NIH study was then published two years later. In this study, there were 34 patients. Uh, a third of them received imitation surgery. A third received a small transplant and a third received a uh, transplant from four fetuses. The smaller one was from one fetus. And what they found was that whilst there was some evidence of graft survival on imaging, whilst there was a significant benefit for improvement in those who had had the transplant clinically, there was no significant difference between these patients. They all had immunotherapy of cyclosporin for six months after this, 
um, as opposed to the previous study where there was no immunotherapy that was given at all. But worrying in this study uh, was the fact that now 54% of the patients had developed dyskinesias in the presence of a transplant when off medication. So here was a second trial that showed that there was no significant benefit in what was thought to be a more rigorous approach because it was a double blind placebo control trial uh, showing that the transplants in both trials had not significantly improved the patients at one and two years and significant side effects were seen in 15 to 54 percent of patients. So in 2003 this field was essentially announced to have had its day and it was no longer a viable option. Now this uh, obviously could be a very sensible conclusion to come to uh, but we sought to uh, sort of reevaluate this on the grounds that whilst these double blind SIBO control trials had produced negative uh, outcomes around their primary outcome, there was nevertheless clearly trends that could be seen in it. And we had these open label studies where there were definite benefits in individual uh, patients. So we set about uh, doing a meta-analysis of all of the studies that had had uh, patients recruited that they had uh, sort of as rigorously as possible followed up for two years. Uh, and we did various analysis as best we could with the limited data. And essentially what we found was that if you plot all the data, so this here is the change in the UPDRS, so that's getting worse, that's getting better. This is two years post-transplantation. About a third of the patients had a good response, by which we mean a greater than 20% improvement in their off score, i.e. when they're not taking medication, so their sort of baseline score implying that they're better. So about a third of patients seem to have a good clinical response, but two thirds didn't. So obviously for this to become a therapy uh, outside of the ethics, you have a problem in that every three patients I take to the operating theatre to use this therapy, only one will improve, which is clearly not competitive. So one of the things we tried to do is we tried to analyse these trials to see if we could work out what were the characteristics of those patients who responded best to that intervention. And essentially what we found was that it was younger, less advanced patients, so patients earlier in their disease journey who were younger, uh, typically under the age of 60, those in which there'd been more rigorous uh, tissue prep and uh, uh, sufficient tissue used. So we would say that you needed at least three uh, ventral mus and kephalons, uh, so three fetuses per side in order to stand a chance of getting the right number of dopamine cells in. We felt that those had the best response had been those trials where immunosuppression had been used and the absence of immunosuppression, whilst not uh, um, stopping transplants from surviving, definitely seemed to compromise their clinical benefits and their survival. And as I've already intimated, longer follow up seems to be an important factor because in those most successful open label studies, it was at least five years before you saw a clinical benefit. So we took this information to uh, the European Union, who very um, bravely uh, uh, funded us to do a study called uh, TransEuro. So that's what the FP7 grant was uh, from uh, the European Union. And essentially this had two major elements to it. One was we set about trying to show that we could select patients who we thought were optimal for this intervention. So uh, part of the reason why patients had not uh, had such variable outcomes in the previous trials was we hadn't thought enough about who were the ideal patients. And we said we thought the ideal patients, as we've already said, were younger patients uh, earlier in their disease course who did not have significant dyskinesias relating to their oral medication who were cognitively normal. And so we wanted to show that if we followed that cohort of patients up over a period of time, they would not dement, they would not develop dyskinesias, they would progress, but they wouldn't progress aggressively. So that was part of the study was the natural history study. Could we better select the patients who might be suitable for this? And then the second part of it was a transplant study where we would optimize the delivery of the tissue, at least three fetuses per side delivered with a device which we knew uh, worked based on a previous work from Sweden. And in the initial uh, iteration, we were going to do an open label transplant study in 20 patients. I mean, this was super optimistic. And then on the back of that, we would have sufficient data to go and do a double blind randomized control trial uh, with match funding for a US arm, which would complement what we were doing in Europe, which we felt would be a more definitive study. So just in terms of the natural history study, I would say that we did demonstrate that this patient selection that we had 
uh, fitted in more what we thought. So paying attention to the patients was important. These are quite hard to see, but essentially over the first three years, they were in this natural history observational study. They progressed with their Parkinson's in a linear fashion. This, uh, the Annabrook's cognitive examination, you have to get less than 84 to be demented. They were entirely normal. Uh, the dyskinesia scores can be up to four. They were not developing dyskinesias and they progressed in a fairly linear fashion. So we felt the patient selection was uh, appropriate and the design of this study was rather than have uh, a sham surgery or placebo was that out of the 100 patients or so, we would randomly select the patients for the open label study who would then have the intervention. A subgroup of the natural history study would also have PET imaging. So ultimately we could compare our intervention against a control arm, the control arm being those who'd been in exactly the same assessment period over a prolonged period of time, uh, who had also had PET imaging, but they hadn't had any other intervention. So they were a contemporaneous natural history control, not historical contemporaneous. So we thought this would be quite a good way of actually being able to um, assess what happened with our patients. So uh, ultimately, whilst the natural history study was very encouraging, the actual transplant study proved to be much more difficult than we ever envisaged. And at the end of a 11-year uh, a period, we had ended up doing one incomplete trial where we had grafted 11 patients, 10 bilaterally and one uh, unilaterally. And I'll come back to why uh, we had such problems uh, grafting, uh, why we grafted so few patients. So what did it show, the transplant study? Well, the sort of take-home figure is it didn't really work in the way that we expected. So one of the advantages of the trial design that we had is that we had a long run-in. So by virtue of what you'll see in a couple of slides time, all the problems we had in this trial, the first patient was grafted in 2015. So we had patients who had been followed up for at least uh, four years before we had an intervention. And in fact, some of these patients have now been followed up for eight years post uh, transplantation. So we have a long running period and we have a long post operative follow up period. And I would strongly recommend this as a way of which by which to assess what your therapy is doing, maybe different in eyes, but certainly in these chronic, slowly progressive degenerative disorders, it's quite helpful. So in this slide at the top, we have a control group here. This control group is the remainder of the study, the remainder of the patients we had in the group who did not have any intervention, but were followed up with the same assessments who went on to also having PET imaging. And what you can see, as you would predict, is over this period of time, which is like a seven year period, the control group, as I've already said in the previous slide, get uh, progressively worse. The transplant group essentially get worse in exactly the same way. They then receive their stage transplants, which makes analysis a bit difficult. But over time, you can see that whilst the, the control group have got progressively worse, these seem to have stabilised. Now, of course, it could be placebo effect, could be investigated bias, but it looks quite convincing and that something has happened around the intervention where the patients have stabilised. Now, there were a couple of other issues with this uh, trial. One is that we discovered just as we were about to transplant our first patient that the hospital here would not ensure the device which we had, uh, uh, which we were using, which was made in-house in Lund. So the transplant device is made in the hospital in Lund. We've used it previously at the Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge for a previous transplant trial in Hunting disease. But here they said it was not insured. So they built a, a, a matching device. And the one thing I can say is that while superficially it may have looked the same, it did not behave the same. So this is the device that was used in Sweden down the bottom here. And you can see that essentially all the patients improved. Different neurosurgeons, so it could be the surgeon, uh, but it could be the device. Preparation was exactly the same. We then actually uh, had one device here, a second device, and then a uh, third, well, this patient, uh, one device and two devices. This patient had one side grafted with one device and one with the other. Whatever the reason for this, whether it was the surgeon, the preparation or the device, clearly the patients in the UK did not do as well as the three patients in Sweden. So three patients were grafted in Sweden, eight in the UK. They started at different baselines. Our patients were more advanced and they didn't really improve uh, so much as the patients in Sweden. And you can see that down here that the device seemed to have a difference. So what we would say from this data is that the transplant had to some extent 
changed the natural history of the treated patient. It had stabilized them to some extent. And on the secondary outcome measures, the things that gave us confidence that this may be a real effect is that the amount of the medication they were taking had reduced. So in the patients uh, who had had the transplant, they were on less medication post-intervention with stabilization of their scores. And that the amount of time when the medication wasn't working off time had also improved. Uh, over time in these patients. And actually, if we wait another five years, I suspect that the transplant group will actually improve over the control group. So what we would say to this is that there seemed to be a partial response which related to the site of surgery and either the surgeon or the device or something about the preparation, but we standardized the preparation. What we were also able to demonstrate was on PET imaging that we saw uh, something uh, very similar. So in the Swedish, so this is uh, the uh, PET imaging post-transplant versus pre-transplant. So F-DOPA looks at the amount of dopamine you have in your uh, brain, particularly in the striatum. In the UK cohort, it actually got worse, whereas in the uh, Swedish patient, it actually uh, got better. And one of the advantages you have of this in, uh, in this study is that this is the overall change in pertaminal dopamine loss so in parkes you'd expect it to go down this is the site of greatest dopamine loss in the brain and you can see this was their baseline this was before they had the transplant and this was post transplant this was 18 months post transplant because we couldn't get all the three year data because of covid there seems to be a stabilization of pertaminal dopamine in the same patients in the chordate which we did not transplant it gets progressively worse as you would expect so what we would say is that there's a partial response in these patients that relates to partial dopamine improvement at the craft site. So I would postulate that the reason the patients didn't improve more than we thought is the devices were suboptimal, especially in Cambridge. The amount of tissue we put in was on the cusp of being sufficient to get enough cells to survive, which is what the PET in data would say. And there may be other factors about disease stage which we hadn't factored in. But then the question uh, sort of arises, well, why did you not do more in transuro? Why did you faff around and only do one partial study? And this is a sort of um, list of all of the problems that we had in the transuro study, which delayed us and stopped us completing the study in the way that we thought. First of all, we had problems with our regulators telling us whether uh, fetal material could be regarded as an advanced therapy. I should stress this is fetal dopamine cells. We have not manipulated this tissue. We've not grown it in culture. We've simply harvested it. At the end, they said this was not an ATIM. Uh, this was a European study uh, and how people saw things in Germany, France, Sweden and England were all very different, which created great problems in trying to harmonise it. Uh, these European grants uh, have different partners in. If they change their status, you have to renegotiate the contract. The Human Tissue Authority here changed the regulations with respect to fetal material uh, three years into our project. So we had to then produce dossiers, which we hadn't been expecting. The company that was helping run this um, consortium went into liquidation. So the management came back to us and we had to then manage all of this uh, complex uh, consortium. One of the people who was leading part of our work sadly died of a brain tumour. Another one uh, left his job uh, uh, as one of the major uh, sites for reasons that was never quite clear, but that closed down a whole area and caused a huge distraction to the study. We had problems in Sweden uh, getting permission to use fetal material because the old permit had run out and no one had uh, renewed it. Uh, we had problems in the GMP lab where we were preparing the tissue with unexpected breakdowns. There were issues in Sweden around where they could prepare the tissue. Uh, just before we were about to start the trial, we found that the two uh, sites, namely Sweden and the UK, which were doing the transplants, had problems in reproducing how we prepared the tissue, which we had to resolve. Uh, as I say, in this hospital in Cambridge, they changed the insurance policy, so we had to build an entirely new instrument based on the one in Sweden, uh, which ultimately, I think, was not the same as the one in Sweden. We moved to your wonderful system, which you have in the States, EPIC, uh, because it caused such mayhem in the hospital to migrate the entire paper system over to electronic. The hospital banned or cancelled all elective surgery for months, which obviously had knock-on effects for this type of work. I had great problems with the hospital sterilising the instrument because it was a new instrument. We didn't have a, an SOP for it, and that caused problems. Uh, and neurosurgical theatres decided that they were going to be refurbished, so they were shut. A large period of time the junior doctors went on strike about pay uh, 
uh, we'd spent so long trying to resolve all these issues that the reagents which we had, for example, the hibernation medium, which we were using the GMP quality at 130,000 pounds, was passing its uh, sell by date. So we had to revalidate all of that. We had great problems with getting tissue transfer, especially post Brexit, trying to get fetal tissue from the UK to Sweden to allow them to transplant patients. Uh, we had the COVID pandemic that caused mayhem with our follow up and our imaging. But a fundamental problem, which means that regardless of what we showed in this trial, we were never going to be able to take this forward, was tissue availability. So for the 21 surgeries we did, the 10 bilateral and one unilateral, we had another 87 surgeries booked in the hospital that were cancelled because we had insufficient tissue. So in order for this to become uh, a success story, as Tom was uh, suggesting in the title, we had to find another source of cells, which obviously comes from a stem cell uh, source. And so this, you could say, well, why didn't I do this at the beginning when Transuro came into existence in 2010? And the reason for that was in 2010, there were no protocols in humans that allowed you to make authentic midbrain dopamine cells. It worked in mice, but the development in humans was rather different to that which had been predicted from mice. So I think it's always critical if you're working on mouse protocols to make sure that the same applies to humans. But there were these two papers that came out in 2011 and 12, one from the group of Lorenz Studer and Vivian Tabar in New York, and the other from Marlin uh, Palmer and Agneta Kirkaby in Lund, that both came up with technologies and protocols which enabled you to reproducibly make midbrain dopamine cells uh, of uh, uh, sufficient likeness or similarity to human fetal nigral cells to allow you to think about moving them forward to a clinical trial. So suddenly in 2011 and 12, we now had an alternative source of cells. These were lab, uh, not GMP protocols that we were using. So clearly work needed to be done to translate that into a GMP uh, ex uh, protocol, which would be accepted by the regulatory authorities. But early on in this work, we decided that one of the ways to try and maximize the uh, potential for this to translate into the clinic was to form a consortium of all of the international groups that were involved with this. So this involved uh, my group in Cambridge, Marlin Palmnagneta and Anders Bjorklund and Ulla Lindvall's group in Sweden, uh, the group from New York, uh, the group from uh, Kyoto in Japan, as well as other groups that were working in this space. The idea being if we all work together, we could learn from each other and take this forward. And in the early stages, this was hugely successful. Um, a, it enabled us to learn from each other and exchange information that was not published uh, to try and help us solve some of the problems we had. It also allowed us to some extent to standardise what we're doing so that whilst the trials, which I'll talk about briefly in a minute, have come to pass, uh, these trials, whilst not being exactly the same, all have a degree of similarity which allows you to make some comparisons. Uh, and essentially we moved this around uh, to different sites so that everyone felt empowered to contribute to it. I have to say it's become more complicated of late, primarily because all of us are now uh, working very closely with companies and therefore the ability to share data becomes uh, slightly more uh, tricky under such circumstances. But essentially the sort of major uh, work that first went to clinic uh, was that of Juntak Ashi groups in Kyoto. As you know in Japan they do a lot more non-human work than we tend to do in Europe and possibly in the US. But in this study uh, Jun showed that by using uh, human IPS cells from patients with Parkinson's as well as patients without Parkinson's, he could convert them into dopamine cells and that they worked over a 12-month period in uh, his monkeys with good survival histologically. And that led to him announcing in 2018 that they had started an uh, uh, allergenic IPS uh, transplant trial in patients with Parkinson's. I think there are seven patients grafted the last patient, last visit in this first in human study from them will uh, be in December, so next month. They, their trial will reach its endpoint, and then the data I, I imagine will be uh, released uh, next year. With respect to our own work, which has really been led preclinically by Marlin, and this again I would say is a very important aspect. Marlin and I work very closely together, Marlin on the preclinical, me on the clinical. She's done some fabulous work with Agneta Kirkaby to demonstrate that these cells actually have the same equivalence to that which you see with uh, human uh, fetal material. So they do transplants of ES-derived 
uh, dopamine cells can compare it to human fetal tissue to show that they project the same, they have the same clinical benefits, they look the same. Uh, and so it, uh, they've also developed predictive markers because obviously what you're injecting are precursors to the differentiated dopamine cells and it's reproducible. So here we have the H9, the S line, the Rosalind cell 17, which is the one we're using in a clinical trial, three different batches, one which was cryopreserved and then a line uh, that was developed in the Karolinska, all of which show reproducible behavioral recovery in this uh, 6-hydroxy dopamine model of uh, Parkinson's uh, disease. So over the course of 10 years, we were able to demonstrate, we in the royal sense, mainly uh, Marlin and Agneta, that you could reproducibly turn these cells into midbrain dopamine cells. We can do it here. Other people can do it. So the protocol is very reliable. You could do it in a way that produced functional recovery in a reproducible way. They seem to have equivalence to human fetal material, which we know, as I've already said, in some cases produces uh, substantial clinical benefits and what really caught farmers interest was the fact that this is a very efficient process so here it only takes 16 days to convert an ES cell into the dopamine precursor and a six well plate of ES cells generates 500 uh, doses therefore if you had a robot and you had a thousand plates you'd be able to do 500,000 patients which is essentially uh, all of the patients you could imagine would need this in Europe in the foreseeable future. And so all of this uh, was published last month uh, in a paper in Cell Stem Cell, which led through the entire preclinical development of this, which was a huge amount of work uh, uh, in order to deliver a cell which is ready for a clinical trial. And that clinical trial began this year. So in February, we were grafted our first patient in Lund in Sweden using their device. We waited a month to check there were no uh, major perioperative problems. And their second patient was grafted in March. And then two more patients were grafted in September of this year. We will now wait six months and then we will graft four more patients, either at the same dose or twice the dose, uh, depending what we see at that period uh, of time. Uh, all of the patients are on uh, standard immunotherapy for a year after their transplant. And we do a number of clinical measures as well as imaging measures. And so this is a trial that is being run as an academic study, but we work very closely with Nova Nordis, who are hoping to develop their own uh, ES-derived cell therapy to run into a clinical trial, which will almost certainly be a global trial. The Japanese group I've already mentioned. Uh, there's been a single case study that I'll briefly mention from Mass uh, General and Harvard of an autologous IPS-derived dopamine cell given to patients with moderately advanced Parkinson's disease. The group of uh, Lorenz Studer, uh, they set up their own company, Blue Rock, which is now a part of Bayer. Uh, they've uh, started their study and uh, released their preliminary results at a meeting. Aspen Neuroscience in California are using an autologous IPS approach and now have FDA uh, permission uh, to uh, start a clinical trial. So this area is very, very active at the moment. And those that have been published already the one patient that was published in the New England Journal was a patient whose skin cells uh, were converted into IPS cells into dopamine cells. And what we could say clinically with this patient was that on imaging, there was no real change in the dopamine signal. There was no objective change in their uh, clinical scores, but subjectively they felt much better. PDQ39 is a quality of life. So for whatever reason, this patient felt the transplant had definitely helped them, even though objectively there was limited evidence for that. And then in the Blue Rock study where they published this or had this poster uh, at a meeting, the movement sort of meeting in August of this year, they used uh, 12 patients who were transplanted every month, uh, uh, one a month at two different doses uh, using an allogeneic ES cell derived dopamine cell. This is rather small to see. It's one year data. We wouldn't expect huge changes. There was some evidence that the higher dose, there were some improvements in their uh, motor scores. Uh, both in terms of the UPDRS, which I've already mentioned, the Hauser Diary is a way people have of scoring their motor uh, uh, performance, and there was a subtle change on imaging. So I think the important message from these trials, which have uh, sort of appeared in this preliminary form today, is it seems safe, and there may be some signal of efficacy, but it's a bit too soon uh, to say. And so just the final thing is, where does the field see itself going? Well, obviously, they're these trials which we have to play out and see whether they're really going to work. I think it's going to take quite a bit of uh, fine tuning and manipulation to make these 
uh, therapies work consistently with a size of effect that's going to make them competitive. Other people are now thinking about whether we can go beyond this and use direct in situ reprogramming. The idea here obviously being to convert uh, uh, 200,000 uh, uh, astrocytes in the, in the uh, striatum to turn into dopamine cells. There have been various claims for this. There have been problems with leakage of uh, reporter genes. So at the moment, whilst it's an interesting idea, that is yet uh, to prove uh, uh, effective. People are now thinking about combining therapies. So could we use growth factors and cells to try and promote the survival of the cells in their innovation? So this is particularly work left by Lachlan Thompson and Claire Parrish in Australia, showing that actually using this combined approach may have some advantages. And then finally, obviously, the use of an ESL enables you to go down the line of gene editing. Uh, one possibility would be to knock out alpha-synuclein in your stem cells, alpha-synuclein being the protein that aggregates in Parkinson's disease. Uh, in these fetal transplants, there has been evidence of alpha-synuclein aggregation in the fetal dopamine cells, uh, raising concerns that the transplant will succumb to the disease process, but it probably, which it probably will, but at least in those cases, it will probably take 40-odd years, by which time the patient would have died of something else, but people are thinking about knocking out alpha-synuclein. And then alternatively, and this is some work we've been doing ourselves recently, is to try and make the cells less immunogenic to remove the need for the patient to take uh, immunosuppressive therapy, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Uh, so we've been looking at an MHC class one to make sure that the cells, once they've had this knocked out, behave in a way which makes them suitable because MHC class one, at least in some developmental studies, is important for normal development synaptic formation. And so there is a risk that if you knock this out in your transplanted cells, they won't be able to integrate in the way that they could if they had this present. I'm not sure this is how necessary this is because um, uh, we know from fetal material, long-term survival can occur in the absence of immunotherapy once you get beyond a certain critical period. So to conclude, I would say the rationale for what we're doing with dopamine cells is clear and we need to replace 200 to 250,000, uh, ideally A9 midbrain dopamine cells to make a difference in part disease. So I would say in the eye uh, or the visual system, you need to be sure that the rationale for what you're doing is clear and logical. And that's not always the case, I'm not saying in the eye, but in many stem cell therapies, especially around these chymal stem cells. Uh, there's been, it's been shown preclinically using human fetal uh, um, midbrain cells and human pluripotent derived dopamine cells uh, that you can get very good restoration and survival. Uh, and I think it, you know it's important to show that this is robust and that it's very important when you're starting on this work to make clear links between the lab and the clinic rather than arrive with a therapy which you then want to take to the clinic. Uh, in human fetal dopamine cell transplant trials, I think there's been proof of principle, but there have also been side effects. We tried to answer that by going to transuro, uh, and that proved to be not a viable way forward because of tissue supply. But I would always uh, empower people to critically appraise trials and to try and work out why things might not have worked rather than always try and say uh, why they should work and whether there's some signal of benefit. I think it's good to be very critical of one's own work and the trials that are out there. Uh, obviously, new stem cell dopamine cells have begun to be trialled. Big farmers involved, that creates some tensions about timelines, uh, but it does give you the investment you need to take this forward. As you can see in Transuro, you have to be patient and persistent. And I would advocate working together as an international consortium uh, before you get uh, too heavily involved with pharma and that before you do anything it's very clear to articulate what it is you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it and have a position of equipoise that it may not work but these are the reasons why I think it would work and in the uh, Parkinson space there's obviously a whole series of other approaches that people are pursuing but what we would advocate with this is that it's not to the exclusion of other therapies but may complement other approaches that people are taking. So finally, I'd just like to thank all the people who've helped in this fantastic uh, journey we've had over many years. This is the lab retreat uh, with the group, uh, my group and Caroline williams Bray, who works in Ponsies, who, who uh, uh, works here with me, and also all of our funders. And this is the fantastic uh, Lund team and our own team in Cambridge that have forged the STEM BD trial. And with that, I will finish, stop sharing, and happily take any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, that's such an interesting uh, few decades uh, that the field has gone through. And I, you know, see a lot of parallels in 
what we have achieved so far and some of the concerns and thoughts that I think have been expressed within the group for where we may be going in the future. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions, but uh, is there anyone else that wants to start us off or should I uh, begin? Maybe there's something in the chat. Ah. That would be me. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, you, Diane, please. Uh, All right. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I'm with Bright Focus, and as you, you might know, we fund uh, glaucoma, uh, macular degeneration, and Alzheimer's. And so um, I guess the the question I'm going to ask you is, I found it very interesting. I mean, of course, um, there were a lot of things that, that uh, might have, uh, as you pointed out, contributed to it not working um, in the first round or not meeting the primary endpoints, at least. But I found it very interesting that uh, similar to a lot of early trials of drugs or whatnot, uh, in the Alzheimer's field, they basically thought that it was due to they were treating people too late in the disease. And uh, and then in the second round, you enrolled people and, you know, maybe it was a little bit better. But um, so I guess for uh, us, like timing in the glaucoma field, right, very important. So are there any uh, lessons that you can tell us about timing and clinical trial design? <laughs> um, and, you know, if you just have to say whatever you discover along the way, I mean, I think we do have a consortium together, you know, Tom has brought a lot of people together. So is there something that we as a consortium could be, should be focusing on to try and make sure that the clinical trial ultimately or trials uh, get planned? <laughs> Yeah. yeah that, I, can I just interject one thing, just because I think that's a great question, and I want to put a specific point on it that relates to the work we're doing. You know, we've thought that uh, patients with milder disease may have a better protoplasm, better microenvironment for the survival and engraftment of RGCs, and yet from a safety and uh, clinical trial standpoint, we're concerned that we, you know, they they have a lot more left a uh, lot more to lose. And so we're we're trying to balance, do we want to transplant point. people with end-stage disease who may have less, eff less efficacy, but less to lose or people with early stage disease? So uh, how did how did you guys navigate that? Because, you yeah. know, you did point out that some of these patients had surgically induced dyskinesias and things. Yeah. So, I mean, the advantage you have is you've got two of them. You got That's true. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so you can always argue to the ethics board or whoever that you know it, 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 if you think you've got your optimal group, we're only losing binocular money. vision is not a nice thing though. No, it's not a nice <laughs> thing. Lose ability to drive. So, so you're absolutely right. So so in our therapy, in some ways, it's relatively easier because what we're trying to do is we're trying to restore dopamine, and you know if you've lost ten percent of your cells or you've lost ninety percent of your cells, we're still trying to replace them. And it probably won't make that much difference. And by the time you present, so you've already lost 50% of them. And that's what we're trying to put back. So so it, so in some ways, um, even if you went later in the disease course, it probably wouldn't matter. Now, my argument would be ultimately this therapy is best used as first line treatment if it works, because it stops people taking all the drugs and all the complications that come thereafter. Now, obviously, if I go to an ethics board or an IRB and say, that's what I want to do, they'll just say, right, well, get on your bike. I mean, you're not going to do that. Um, and so, but similarly, if they say, well, you want to go for people like cancer, you know, they failed everything else, they're at the end of the road. I mean, they're, you know, they wouldn't survive the operation. Uh, trying to get a benefit from people who have many other problems is an issue. So I think what you have to do is you have to argue who you think your optimal group and why that is, being cognizant of the fact that uh, the ethics board are going to err on the side of caution. So in, in interestingly, when I've had discussions with the FDA or my colleagues in the States, the FDA are much keener on people being more advanced than they are in other places. So in the in the Blue Rock study, the patients were more advanced in New York than they were in uh, Toronto because the Canadian uh, regulators were more open to be persuaded that you could go earlier in the disease course. So mm -hmm. I, I think if you've got good arguments, so I think I think, you know, one of the arguments you can say is you say, well, they should you should be going in people with end stage disease. I would say I cannot. I, I mean, I don't know enough about eyes, but if I said the network's degenerated, I'm trying to repair a system that's gone and it's not going to connect to anything. I think it's unethical to uh, expose people to experimental therapy for which I have no expectation that it could work because we've missed the critical window by which to, to go. You could say the optimal group of the patients in the very early stages, but I think, you know, for your first studies, you're going to have to go for some point in between. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, so you're saying it's a Goldilocks problem. <laughs> it is, but I, but I think I think the most important thing, I, I, want, I mean, the FDA, dare I say it less than, than perhaps the MHRA here, they're open to discussion. Because this is all new, I think they're open to hear why you think you should be choosing this group of patients. I think what they object to is you say, I'm going to do this group of patients, uh, and you don't really, you say, it's just going to work. It's going to work in this group. That's what I need to do without sort of saying, I understand this, I understand that. So I think giving the arguments as to why you think this is the optimal group and then accepting the fact you may have to go slightly more than that, but also saying, I'm not prepared to treat people with end stage disease because I think that's that's not ethical. Well, and and uh, and I don't want to like uh, just a follow up. So uh, I think that what one of the one of the things that was cool about the I think it was lecanemab, whatever that with the um, IV antibody treatment that was approved, the latest one, they actually enrolled people with comorbidities in that, and they were successful. So that's also something to consider. You don't necessarily have to exclude people who have comorbidities but anyways i'll let yeah, other people ask questions what you're trying to do so so for us we're trying to restore a network that's gone if you're trying to stop a disease process so for example growth facts epoxy is one of the big reasons they've all failed is they're trying to put fertilizer onto a field that's got no seed in it it's all gone hmm. so i mean you know if you're trying to restore a network and obviously the amyloid antibodies are trying to stop the disease evolving you have to go earlier so again if you have a good rationale for why your therapy should be used earlier in the disease course because it's working to stop downstream degeneration then i think again that's a strong argument you can put forward and tom there's another question from muhammad in the chat oh yeah muhammad are you on do you want to just ask it maybe he doesn't have a microphone uh, so he said, thank you for your inspiring presentation. I was wondering if the pars compacta or pars reticulata or both of them were considered for transplantation. Also, were transplantations performed bilaterally? Yeah, so so it's a good question. Uh, so the group in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Ivor Mendes, he did do transplants of fetal material into the night or into the midbrain. I would guess they went into the nigra uh, and into the striatum. So he did both sites. And his clinical, his patients did rather well, but the question is, did they do any better for having transplants in those two sites? Um, the problem with transplanting into the compactor is uh, it's a long way from there to the striatum and can the fibres grow sufficiently up to that uh, target site, innovate um, in sufficient density to mediate that. Uh, so that's unclear, uh, but at the moment people are going whether dopamine cells uh, work, which is in the striatum or dopamine works. Were the transplants done bilaterally? Um, uh, with the fetal material, they weren't, but that's not because for any surgical reasons, it's we just didn't have sufficient material. It was argued that if we had got sufficient fetal material, we would have done both sides at the same time. And with stem cells, obviously, we do have. So in the stem PD trial, the patients have, I think it's about an eight or 10 hour bilateral operation. So both sides are done at the same time. Great. If anyone else has any questions, uh, feel free to either put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I wanted to ask a question. You know, one of the major things that <clears throat> the retinal ganglion cell transplantation field is dealing with right now is rather poor survival of their neuronal grafts. I think yeah. among the several laboratories that have published on this, it seems like less than 1% of the total cells that are transplanted into the eye survive for more than a few weeks. Um, and we're trying to figure out what are all the various factors that uh, contribute to that. So I was wondering, first, um, if you could tell us a little bit, you know, you, you told us what you need to achieve as far as 200 to 250,000 A9 dopaminergic neurons. How many do you actually transplant in order to expect to achieve the survival of those cells? And then- yeah. What sorts of factors do you think um, are are uh, undermining the long term survival, and what approaches is the fee? You talked a little bit about MHC, so MHC compatibility. So I think it, you know immunomodulation, uh, immunoreactivity uh, is one thing. Growth factor support is one thing, um, yeah. but uh, yeah. So what, what are the? Yeah, it's a, it's, it, it's a good question. I mean, we we get a we get a better survival, but I mean, it's not it's not crackerjack. I mean, we get mm -hmm. about five or ten percent. Uh, 
Mm. So we so we graft. Um, so what? So one of the advantages with what we've done in STEM PDL is the the cell product we've got, which we're putting into patients, is also the very same cell product we've used in the lab. So it's all cryopreserved. So so you have to infer that the survival you see in rats can be extrapolated to the human brain. But it's but we put in between uh, I think three and seven million cells, depending. How, so first dose is about three and a half million. The second one will be seven million to get about two hundred some thousand surviving cells. So so it's just less than ten percent, somewhere between five and ten percent. So the survival is very poor. But for us, that's less of an issue because ultimately the the surviving population is relatively small. Now. I, I mean, you could argue, because I don't know how many retinal ganglion cells are, but I bet they're not that many, uh, that, that, you know, you could argue, because we're not talking about millions and millions, you could say, well, even if I get 1% survival and I, and I need, an, you know, half a million of these, uh, it, it, whilst I'm putting in 50 million, in the great scheme of things, that might not be the, the biggest number in the world. So you could just mm -hmm. say, I don't really care that so few survive, I'm just going to put in more starting material. Yeah. Now, as to what drives that, I, I I don't know. I mean, obviously, it's a pretty. I mean, if I was a cell being grafted, it's a pretty stressful experience. I mean, you, you've got to be prepared. First, we've got to be woken up from a frozen state, which I think compromises them. I mean, we've shown that it doesn't significantly compromise them, but they're never as good as fresh tissue. Uh, then you obviously have to load them into a device to deliver them, and you're putting it into a pretty ischemic, hypoxic environment, regardless of what that looks like, because you're obviously sticking a needle in, generally speaking, and injuring the site where you're implanting the cells. The other thing which we started to do, which was a bit of a shock, if I'm quite honest, was um, on a separate project, we've been quite interested in inflammation in the brain and what drives that. So we've been doing single nuclear RNA sequencing uh, work in the postmortem brain. And we had these various sites. And I said, just take the putamen as a control area because, I mean, it'd be interesting because we stick dopamine cells there and it's pretty quiet. And found out that that area is pretty inflamed in Parkinson's disease. So I think understanding what your host so I suppose what that told me was that the disease, whatever disease you're treating, you need to know what it's doing at the site where you're putting the cells in a way that I think we'd slightly underestimated. So I think we'd assume that all of the problems were relating to tissue prep and the injection process, which I agree with. But I think knowing more about your disease state where you're putting them and what how that may compromise your, your cells is also important to know. So obviously for us, in, you know, inflammation is an issue, but we give immunotherapy uh so it probably damps it down um but i think it is a problem and people have obviously tried this antioxidants great factors putting them in with your cells the trouble is the more you manipulate these things the more problems it creates with regulators mm. um, yeah great uh another question i had you talked a little bit uh briefly about the fact that you need dopamine there, but there's sort of a difference between cells that just pump out dopamine versus uh, integrating into like circuits or forming synapses where it's it's given in a, a regulated or specific manner. Um, yeah. And, you know, that may be one uh, area in which uh, our two approaches or two challenges uh, diverge a little bit because for ganglion cells, obviously, the wiring is going to be absolutely critical to their ability to function correctly. So I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about the preclinical or if there's any postmortem human tissue in uh, what kind of circuits or synapses these things form or what controls that or how you can. Uh... Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think what's extraordinary um, so uh, is that if you make the right cells, they seem to know what to do. So obviously, uh, a ganglion cell having to make an axon that's got to go a long way. Yeah. I mean, I've just, I've just, I mean, I, I don't know how it would do it, but, but one of the ways in which Marlin, for example, has tried to look at the axonal outgrowth from her ES-derived dopamine cells is to transplant them into the rat nigra, um, not because we're trying to recreate the nigral striatal circuit as a way of treating patients, but to see whether those cells could grow to the striatum, which is about you know a centimeter or so. Uh, which would be sufficient in a human to innovate the, the attainment. And what you find that's curious about these things is if you transplant these cells in, they grow axons to the striatum. They don't grow axons to the thalamus or other areas of the brain. You know, So the dopamine cells which differentiate out of that produce axons and 
for whatever reason they know where they're going even in the rat brain so there's something about their ability to pick up signals in the striatum which enables them to do that and uh, i mean i've just been um, writing a review with anders bjorkland on cholinergic transplants to the to the uh, sort of the hippocampal uh, and he was citing a paper in that where in, in the 1980s they transplanted in you know basal forebrain cholinergic neurons uh, striatal cholinergic interneurons and brainstem cholinergic neurons and the only one that innovated the hippocampus anything like normally were basal forebrain cholinergic neurons either ones that normally do it hmm. so just having cholinergic cells uh, of any type in the same way as if you have a 10 dopamine cells they do not do what a9 do so i guess for you if you could produce retinal ganglion cells that are the real mccoy one might anticipate that they would actually just grow their axons to their normal site in the in the brainstem and the touchline. So, mm -hmm. so um, it seems. I, I mean, I I don't know, but it seems if you make the right cell, the right cell seems to know what to do. Interesting. That's encouraging. Yeah. Um, now, you you mentioned though that you're transplanting neuronal precursors, right? Are yeah. these aren't fully mature A nine uh dopaminergic neurons can yeah. you tell me a little bit about that has has have both been tried and precursors do better or uh, uh how yeah, do you so know it's... sort of what stage of maturity is yeah. optimal for your system yeah we don't know is the honest answer to that okay um, so what we could say from fetal material is that if you if you take tissue which is uh you, you know you've got mature neurons and then you harvest them you basically exotomize them mm -hmm. and then you transplant those they they're not happy uh, not surprisingly so they die off so we've known that for years and with human fetal material people have used you know late fetal material 10 12 even second trimester material and it never survives and so that's always thought to be due to exotomy and getting cells at the point at which they're they're sort of destined to become dopamine cells but aren't there yet so that we think is an important feature of it now what do we know about uh pluripotent stem cell derived dopamine cells what we can people have different differentiation protocols and people who've gone beyond 16 days so gone to 21 25 day protocols their transplants never look very good or they don't look as good so it seems that if you allow the cells to mature further in culture to a point where they uh, perhaps are more uh, committed and becoming dopamine neurons they survive less well so the sweet spot coming back to that uh, we were discussing earlier about the patient is the exact time at which you think your cell has got no choice but to become a dopamine cell um but is also uh i not too primitive it could go anywhere but not too advanced that you you exotomize it and therefore you reduce it so it's difficult to know exactly when that is and obviously one of the things that we well agneta particularly spent a lot of time doing was trying to come up with markers in culture or fact markers which are predictive of where your transplant will go in six months time because these are essentially pro drugs we put the cell in and in rat models they take five to six months before they have a functional benefit and what we wanted was to have markers in the dish that when we harvest our day 16 precursors we have a batch of markers which are predictive of them becoming dopamine midbrain neurons six months later mm -hmm. so i think that's an important thing which which the regulators like and it also gives you great reassurance that if you're especially when you start making more batches of these things that each batch is the same as the last one in terms of it's having these same markers great quite group today anyone else with any questions i've still got more but oh good brent brent and hi i'm uh brent young from jeff goldberg's lab at stanford um so you mentioned that the device you had to make recreate the device to do your clinical trials um did you ever determine what was the major difference between yours and the sweden device that was the difference maker or is that still unclear uh i think everything was wrong with it uh <laughs> i i mean i'm not the neurosurgeon and you wouldn't want me to do neurosurgery even on a good day i'm a neurologist but but i mean i think i think what that taught me was that this sort of because the device is quite simple. I mean, it's it's basically just a needle. You're injecting things. It's just small volumes that you're injecting. So you wouldn't think it was that difficult. Um, but actually, I, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the devil is in the detail, really. You know, it, I think, so first of all, they had problems. I mean, I'll never forget the first one. I got out the package. I couldn't actually move it because they glued the plunger in. And the next one I got out, it just fell straight out the bottom. 
of the needle and you sort of think well this is not great so we had to go back and fiddle with it but it's just i don't think it had the fidelity to i think the end of the needle was probably a bit sharper than it should be so i suspect it killed cells as they went in i'm not sure how accurate it was and the mistake i made was that i assumed that the making of a device was relatively straightforward because it was copying something that had gone before and so we did no testing on this uh essentially we just assumed if we could i mean we showed that it, we could uh get uh, you know, a few microliters out, but we never tested the, the viability of the cells that were coming out of it. We never used it in any animals uh, before we actually went into patients. And that, I think, was a mistake on my part, that actually we should have been more rigorous about that. And it is a big area in our field because, you know, in ophthalmology, you've got all sorts of, I mean, people love gadgetry in the eyes and all sorts of devices for squirting things in and recording and doing all sorts of things. So you've probably got all sorts of devices, but I would tell you it's absolutely imperative to make sure that your your cells are compatible with the device and don't just assume that they are because the device has been used to put things in the retina before VEGF or whatever, you know, you need to make mm -hmm. sure it's compatible with the device. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, I know companies mm -hmm. have spent uh, you know, eight figures on trying to build devices to deliver these cells, which you think would be ridiculous. You think it would cost nothing, but actually making devices, because there is no device which is currently available for delivering cells to the brain. So in your field, I would say it's absolutely essential to make sure that whatever you put your cells in are compatible, uh, whatever you put your cells in, they're compatible with those cells and you don't compromise them. Because coming back to Tom's point, if only 1% of your cells survive, and this compromising by another 50%, you're only getting 0 .0, uh, 0.5, you know. And so, when, and you could see in Transura, we drop below a threshold to have a significant limit. I think we still have something, but it's it's clearly we've, we've messed up somewhere in delivering them, I think. Hmm. Just jumping off of what, <clears throat> jumping off of what Brent was saying, um, so do you think that that was the major reason why this, the surgeon, um, the surgery between Sweden and UK were so different? Um, but, or was there like, uh, did they have the same instructions or protocol or do you think there needed to be a little bit more, um, more checklists or more um, coordination? I think I think we try to coordinate it as much as possible. So the surgeon we used here in Cambridge, you know, does a lot of deep brain stimulation. So, I mean, he's, you know, he's a very experienced stereotactic neurosurgeon. He's obviously done no transplants before. And the neurosurgeon in Sweden um, had similarly not done any transplants before and is a very accomplished stereotactic neurosurgeon. He probably, if I'm honest, he's more interested in in the science and the so he's been heavily involved with the device for STEM PD and such like. So there probably so the could have been some surgical differences. We tried to standardize the protocol as much as we could. I mean, the structure we're trying to hit is quite big, so it's not particularly technically difficult in that sense. They use the same sort of approaches, you know, with the frame and uh, planning before they did it. They compared notes because we had one patient where we had problem localizing the tit cells, missed the target. So they spent ages going through that together. So there was a lot of... Um, uh, uh, coordination between it, but you obviously, I, I've no idea. It's ten years later, so maybe there could be more like Zoom or <laughs> whatever. Yeah, and so, what, and so what we do now is Thanks. with our STEM PD is that they liaise with every single patient. But I think the fundamental difference was that the devices were clearly different. And the interesting thing coming from a biochemistry background, I know. Uh, I would have to use polypropylene instead of polystyrene because my protein would stick to that plat, you know, styrene plastic and not the other. So I don't know, was there a coating on the <laughs> I mean yeah, those I cells the obviously have ECM and whatnot. So did you coat yeah. the device? <laughs> I, I, uh, as far as I know, we didn't, but what I but what I would say is I think, you know, coming back to the point I made earlier, superficially these devices look the same. But they clearly weren't. Yeah. And yeah. and I think and so the problem and so you know other groups say for example the um, New York group as far as I know they've used a clear point system for delivering so they do improper MRI to show where they're putting the cells well that system you know is very good for delivering chemotherapy to cancers in brains and things like that but it's never been used for cells so so again you know it, I'm sure it's fine for the cells but I don't know they that get the name. coordination at the beginning so that the uh, regulatory people are on <laughs> yeah uh, on board at the from the outset I guess. And it's also a bit boring. So, but the problem is, you know, if you if you invest years of science into making the best cells in the world, 
and then someone squirts them in with something which kills them. I mean, that will kill your program. And there's nothing wrong with the science. It's all about delivery. And so it is, I think it's a, it's a slightly neglected area. Yeah, absolutely. This is fantastic. I want to end with one uh, final area of discussion. And that is, uh, you know, something that is in the future for us. We're clearly in the preclinical stages now working out how these stem cell transplants behave in animal models. Um, but I think in the future, when it comes time to start thinking about clinical trials, it is clear that uh, funding, but also industry, I think is important, industry partnerships. Uh, and you had alluded to some uh, challenges that that uh, invokes when you're talking about large collaborative groups. Uh, but I'm also kind of interested in knowing, you know, the the, the industry members are going to be necessary for developing things like the techniques and the tools to do these transplants. At what point uh, within the preclinical stages uh, do you did you find that industry became interested and in, uh, seeing this as a viable approach that would go towards? clinical translation and clinical trial and when did you start those interactions and how did that go yeah so it's a very good question and i don't really know the right answer to it so i would say the advantage of obviously having farmer investment is when things go wrong and you suddenly need a lot of money and input they're fantastic so for us all the cmc they i mean Novo were just fantastic i mean they just have such expertise you know and then you suddenly have to buy a buffer at, you know goodness knows how many hundreds of thousands pounds euros dollars doesn't matter when it's up at that price we simply you cut you simply couldn't and you go to a charity and say could you give me half a million to buy you know five micro five milliliters or something uh, you know so so they're fantastic they have the expertise and they have the financial support the, the downside is of course they're driven a their programs may stop tomorrow for reasons that you don't know uh uh and secondly they obviously have a speed of turnaround which they're very keen on and for us, you know, cells take five years. Well, if I say I'm going to do one dose of cells, wait five years and see what happens, you, you can imagine what the company thinks of that. So those are the advantages and the tension between it. I think what's quite useful is to, is to make sure in your own mind that you're, you're pretty close to going to where you want to go in the clinic and that you have some ownership of what it is you want to do with that. So for us, I mean, it, it was more fortuitous than anything else. So in the Blue Rock case, as far as I know, you know, Lorenz and Vivian had funding from NY STEM that was coming to an end. They weren't going to get funding from NIH, I think, to take this forward into the next stage. Uh, I think in part because, you know, Trump was around and all sorts of things. So so they decided to set up a company and get investment. And that then gave them obviously quite a degree of freedom, but they were obviously under the... So they decided once they'd really got to the end of it that they would they would get investment and take it from there. And obviously buyer now are involved with it or they leave them to, to plan the rainwork. In our case, it was more by chance you know we were we were seeking to develop up the therapy and then look for a commercial partner and the commercial partner came and found us simply through a casual conversation mm. um and then what i found quite interesting was it's all around uh ip uh which which again you know you're much more on top of than we are here uh and of course it's different in this country so in my case the university owns the ip in sweden the individual owns the ip um so that so so i think to get industry on but i think what's quite useful is to be clear in your own mind think i'm pretty close now i've got this up to uh to i know what i'm doing i can make these things my gmp protocol looks pretty good um i'm thinking of a clinical trial i already know who i want to work with this now i would quite like someone to come and fund my clinical trial and then the key thing is to make sure that you have some say on who you're that you're they use for their advisors mm. because one of the problems is the people, I don't know what it's like in the world of eyes, but, you know, some of the people who are very well-known and eminent movement disorder specialists don't know anything about cells. And so their approach to trials are based on drugs or other interventions or neurosurgery. And, and therefore, what they say is not necessarily uh, right or helpful. But the company relies on that because that's what they've been told. And then you end up this slightly difficult conversations trying to persuade them that actually their expert advice might not be as expert as they think. Um, but I think it's very, I think without, so at one point in my life, you know, you think this was all something you should never do. But to be honest with you, if you haven't got investment from pharma, you're going to go nowhere with this. Right. Because these trials cost millions. And if it's ever going to become a, a, you know, market therapy, then someone's going to have to take it all away. Yeah, exactly. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a, a really interesting conversation. Uh, it's it's beautiful to see how this work has progressed over the decades. And congratulations on getting it this far. Uh, best of luck in the trial. I hope the patients do wonderfully. And uh, uh, most of all, just thank you for sharing. I appreciate thank it. Thank you very much for inviting me. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Bye-bye.